Good morning. morning. Welcome to Oak Knoll Lutheran Church this morning. On this third Sunday in Lent, we are grateful that you have joined us, whether that be here in person or online via the live stream. Thank you for being here. We have an upcoming book study this coming um, or this coming spring uh, for an opportunity uh, to join in. Uh, to read Brene Brown's Daring Greatly starting the week of April 4th, right after Easter. The subtitle is How the Courage to be Vulnerable Transforms the Way We Live, Love, Parent, and Lead. And so the first session will be, uh, like I said, after Easter, Thursday, April 4th, and meeting the consecutive three weeks after that. And there's flyers around the church building, and so we invite you to consider if you would like to join us for that. Uh, The funeral of Ed Beck will be uh, taking place here tomorrow morning uh, at 2 p.m. with a visitation at 1. And so we encourage you to be present as we remember and celebrate the life of Ed tomorrow. On Wednesday, we'll continue with our Lenten soup suppers. We'll uh, have the same format that we've had for Advent in these first couple weeks. So we will join for a time of fellowship and to share a meal in Fellowship Hall at 545 on Wednesday, and then we'll transfer over here to the sanctuary at 630 uh, this week for Holden Evening Prayer. Uh, There's a parents' night out that's the high school youth fundraising to go to New Orleans, Louisiana for the ELCA Youth Gathering. We'll be hosting this coming Friday from 530 to 830, and so any children aged 3 to 11 are uh, welcome to sign up for that for uh, three hours on Friday evening where the youth will be hosting a meal and some crafts and games uh, for that. So you can sign up online, um, I believe out in the Northex as well. And then last but not least, men's Bible study will be taking place this morning as well, following worship at 1045 in the media room. And so all are welcome to join us for that time together. There's lots more going on in your bulletin, so we invite you to reference that for a full list of everything going on in the life of Oak Knoll right now. But let us take a moment now to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. time of grace now is the day of salvation go now and see God's face now behold God's invitation this is the fast that God would choose to loose the bonds of injustice to let the captives go free and to break of oppression now is the time of grace now is the day of salvation to now and see God's face now behold God's invitation sharing your bread with the hungry and welcoming homeless in offering Now behold God's invitation, then you shall light break forth as dawn, and healing shall come to you quickly, then you shall call and God shall answer, God's love shall go before you, now is the time of grace, now is the day of salvation. See God's face now. Behold God's invitation. I invite the congregation to stand and face the baptismal fonts.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who writes love on our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our numbers are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silenced when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred. For all these things, and for sins only you know, forgive us, Lord. Here is a flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us, breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Return my soul to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you, and return in faith and best your eyes from tears, your feet from stumbling. In peace, in peace, let us pray.
Lord be with you. Let us pray together. The Son of God, he spoke words to Jerusalem's leaders that were hard to hear. Give us ears to receive your word of life and follow you faithfully. Amen. All children are invited up for the kids' sermon this morning. Good morning. Come on up. Have a seat. have here do you think legos. legos blocks yeah exactly now if have any of you ever built something with legos before yeah yeah, yeah. Keep, yeah. every morning i just start building every morning you start building that's pretty cool that's a passion of yours and not you though huh i never do. you never do well isn't that fun that we all have different ways we start our morning yeah yeah okay well I think when we're going to do Legos, it's good that we have something to, to work on, right? Like something that we can build them on. So I brought a few things I thought we could try. Let's see here. How about a ball? Wouldn't a ball be good to build Legos on? No. See, look at how good that is. Oh, oh no, what happens? So is this not a good thing to build Legos on? Okay, so a ball is not a good thing. You have a Lego tray. Well, how about this plastic femur? Do you think that would be good? To, how about that? Is that going to be a good thing? Oh, that's not a good... I got glue on my shirt. You have a femur on your shirt. Well, isn't that appropriate? Wow, we should... Almost like we talked to each other this morning before we came to church, right? Yeah, okay. Well, how about this? Anyone know what this is? It's kind of like a birdhouse. It's an outhouse, that's right. Yeah, it's like a birdhouse. Now, do you think that would be a good thing to build Legos on? No. No. Well, it's kind of, a, it's kind of flat, though, but maybe, maybe not the best place to build, build your Legos, right? Kind of s- slides off, right? Well, what about this thing here? This looks kind of cool. What do you think this might be? You don't think so? Is that for a phone? Well, let's just see. What if I were to do this? Do you think that would be all right now? If I could, no? No, it's not gonna work? I'm really committed to this here. I'm gonna see if I can make this work. See, that's kind of flat. What do you think? No? No? Yes. Yes, okay. Differences of opinion here. Well, what is, that's all I brought. What else could I use to build these on? The ground? Well, that's pretty true, right? The ground, is the ground going to move? No. No. It's, it's stable, isn't it? It's a sure foundation. In our opening hymn, we sang about Jesus being our sure foundation and our cornerstone. Do you know what a foundation is? It's all of our houses are built on a foundation. That's like where the concrete is and all the, the wood and everything gets built on that very strong foundation. It's a good thing to have something like the flat surface, right, when we're building things. And all homes have a sure foundation, hopefully. And Jesus, we're invited to to think of him as our sure foundation, that when our lives have Jesus, and and our lives do have Jesus, um, that we are strong because of him. He is the one who gives us support and strength for all of our life. And so that might be, you know, it's always tricky doing metaphors for a children's sermon, but I want you to think about that, and maybe the adults can help us think about that too. I know Christina will help us think about that in Sunday school as well. Well, let's bow our heads and say our prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are our foundation, that because of you, our lives are built on God's love, and your love for us will never shake And on that foundation, we can be sure. 
All this we give thanks for in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. All right, thanks for coming up. You can go to Sunday school with Christina or back to your pew if you're going to stay with your family. Jesus was in the temple and he was speaking with the chief priests, the scribes, and Pharisees who were questioning him. Our lesson today is a reading from Mark, the 12th chapter. Then Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to, to collect from them their share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another slave to them. And this one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat, others they killed. He still had one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the keystone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. When they realized that he had told the parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd. So they left him and went away. The word of the Lord. Well, the history of construction, there are a great number of examples of structures built upon poor foundations. Perhaps one of the most famous ones is the Leaning Tower of Pisa that was constructed of 800 or so years ago. Did you know that the Washington Monument was also like the Leaning Tower of Pisa when it first started? I didn't know that until I was doing some research this past week. We could have had our very own Leaning Tower of Washington in Washington, D.C., but they did not continue after it began to lean. After it was about a third of the way completed, the first incarnation of the monument was leaning two inches off center. Why? Because it had a poor foundation. Getting the theme of today's sermon here? Yeah. Well, this lean caused cracks that would have doomed the structure to eventually fall over. So, what do you do? Well, they decided, let's just stop building it. For 20 years, they just stopped and didn't do anything with it. Well, after 20 years, they hired uh, an engineer with the U.S. Corps of Army Engineers, and um, that individual said, well, this is what we're going to start over. We're going to double the size of the footprint of the monument, and we're going to put it deep down into the earth where there is a good foundation. And sure enough, that did the trick. And in 1885, so 29 years after it had first started, the Washington Monument was dedicated. It couldn't have been built without a strong foundation. Well, throughout history, there are examples of buildings and structures that have gotten off to false starts that then had to be torn down, or like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, become a tourist attraction uh, because of their poor 
foundation. Now, if you have a home or an apart, live in an apartment with a poor foundation, that's not good, right? You're gonna have cracks in the walls, you may have water that seeps in through the basement, all kinds of things are, uh, all kinds of damages can happen when you don't have a good foundation. A good foundation is the key for everything that is built on top. Well, just as a good foundation is important for structures and buildings, so too is a good foundation important for human communities, for human societies, for human lives and cultures. Hopefully, the foundations on which our lives are built are positive. Sometimes, however, foundations can be strong, but also negative. Think of the foundation of racism in our nation's history, for example, or the system of apartheid that existed for decades in South Africa. Those are strong foundations, but negative ones. Those foundations perpetuated division and inequity, and they were instituted to restrict, limit, and even take life. And although they were strong foundations, they were sinful, evil, and contrary to God's intentions for this world. Jesus came to dismantle such systems, such foundations, and to bring forth a new building code, a building code for human relationships in which the foundations of oppression were replaced with foundations of liberation. And upon those foundations of liberation and new life, God's kingdom would be built. Now in today's scripture, Jesus tells a parable that holds up a mirror to his adversaries. Through this story, Jesus exposed their ill intentions to use violence as a foundation for their power and position to keep them. Jesus told the story of a man who planted a vineyard, who planted it, and then built a watchtower over it. This man entrusted the vineyard to tenants, expecting both them and the vineyard itself to become fruitful and to yield a good harvest. Yet when the owner sent his servants to go and collect what was rightfully his, the tenants said no. They rejected and even beat the servants and sent them back. The owners finally thought, well, I'm gonna send my son, thinking they'll respect him. However, the, ten the tenants who were blinded by greed rejected and killed the son, believing that violence would secure for themselves this property and the wealth that would go with it. Jesus' adversaries, after hearing him tell this parable, clearly heard this as an accusation, as an indictment of them. And they didn't take kindly to it. So, in the following verses and chapters, they conspired to get rid of him, to silence him permanently. On Friday, Alex Navalny's funeral was held in Moscow. Navalny, as you know, or may know, was Putin's most vocal and well-known critic. Initially, the Ru Russian government refused to hand over Navalny's body to his family to have a funeral. And since his death, there have been hundreds of people arrested for publicly mourning his death. And on the day of his funeral in Moscow, the government was reported to have slowed down cell service all around the church so that his funeral could not have been broadcast over the internet to a worldwide audience. Putin is clearly afraid of Navalny's continued power, even in death. It has been reported by multiple sources that Navalny was a Christian and that his faith was a source of strength for him in his imprisonment as well as in his advocacy for the Russian people to be free and democratic. Navalny's foundation of faith was stronger than Putin's threats. Navalny lived out his foundational faith by protesting Putin's oppressive and authoritarian regime for the sake of Russia's people, even at the risk of his own life. He was 
poisoned, he was imprisoned, and finally killed. And through it out, the foundation of his faith gave him strength to advocate peacefully and publicly and with great strength because of Jesus. Ironically, Putin justified Navalny's imprisonment under the guise of protecting Russia from the godless West. But ask yourself, who do you think aligns more closely with Jesus? Navalny or Putin? Whose words and actions are the real threat to God's intentions for this world? Today, there are many in our world who justify their actions as Christian, but just like Jesus' adversaries in the parable, their foundation, their values, their priorities, words and actions are contrary to those of God. In our own country, Christian nationalism is on the rise. It has nothing to do with following Jesus. More accurately, it's a term that's been co-opted by a partisan group to further their political agenda rather than being a group built on the teachings of Jesus, of being his followers. And many Christian nationalists are not against using violence if it moves them closer to achieving political power. In a poll published last fall by the nonpartisan Public Religion Research Institute, 23% of U.S. adults said that they believe true American patriots may have to resort to violence to save the country. 23%, that's almost a quarter of our fellow citizens who are adults. This is a 10% rise from the same poll question taken in 2021. And as concerning as that poll is, those who identify as white evangelical Protestants are even more supportive of using violence to advance their political agendas. These are people who have Christian in the name of their group. 33% of those identifying as white evangelical Protestants support the use of violence to achieve their political objectives. Even as Jesus taught, lived, and revealed violence to be sin and contrary to God's will for this world. The Christian Nationalist Foundation is not Christ. It's not Jesus. For Jesus, violence was never justified. He even went to the cross to expose our human system of violence as sin, as wrong, as contrary to God's kingdom. And Easter was God's validation of Jesus as choosing and showing us God's truth. After Jesus told the parable of the tenants in the vineyard to his adversaries, he recited Psalm 118, verse 22, which states, the stone the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone. In this profound scripture, Jesus indicts humanity for our embrace of systems and beliefs that are contrary to those of God. And Jesus proclaims himself as the true and rightful foundation for the building of God's kingdom. The scripture recognizes that Jesus' humble birth, his radical and inclusive ministry, and his association with sinners were stumbling blocks for those who expected a triumphant earthly king who ruled by force. Jesus didn't fit the mold for earthly foundations that we had built up for millennia, and because of that, he was a threat. So, we killed him. And then we went on using the same foundations we'd always used, even as those systems perpetuated oppression and death. As long as the status quo was kept, we felt secure, at least we know how things go. But then something happened. The stone we condemned and cast off into obscurity on Good Friday was exalted three days later. And it became the cornerstone of a new foundation which built a kingdom of abundant and radical grace. The very stone we rejected became the cornerstone for God's kingdom come. This morning we began our service with confession and forgiveness, acknowledging our rejection of Jesus, his ways, his teachings, and his intention for us. And we also received words of forgiveness 
Jesus is our cornerstone, and because that is so, we celebrate that forgiveness, because that is now part of our story too. Our lives are now built upon him, even when we feel rickety at times, or perhaps uneven, or on a shaky ground. And because that is so, we can know and trust that Jesus dwells within you and within me, calling us to embody his love and inclusion and nonviolence in this world. Our bodies and souls are now temples for this living Christ. Even when our exterior needs new paint or our roof needs new shingles or our interior needs new infrastructure or a remodel, Jesus is with us. So this day and all days, trust in him as your sure and strong foundation, as the cornerstone for your life, and stand up firmly on that foundation as you share his peace, his love, his grace, all as we work to reconcile this broken and fragile world. Amen. Please join me as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again, living in the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. United in the hope and joy of resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of the journey, we each play a role in the global system that can either create staggering injustices or work for a lasting and cooperative change for the betterment of all. Keep us mindful of how our individual actions can have far-reaching effects that we would make wise and loving choices for the sake of our neighbor. We pray to you.
giving God, we praise you for all the good stewards who have come before us, caring deeply for their communities, church, and world. Inspire us to do likewise, to care for your vineyard, that it continue to bring and foster life for our time and for those generations who will follow us. We pray to you. Healing God, we are all charged with the loving care of those in our lives who face physical and emotional challenges. Today we pray for Heidi, Chuck, Marcella in hospice care, and we pray for peace among nations where war and violence rage, especially Palestine and Israel, Syria, Myanmar, Russia and Ukraine, and Sudan and for the, all, all those we now name silently or aloud. Lois. Okay. We pray too that you comfort those who mourn, especially Jan Benson and family on the death of her husband, Bruce. We pray to you. Confident you walk alongside us in our need, we lift to you all our prayers. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please greet one another with a sign of God's peace.
let us pray together. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered, that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks. And he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In a moment, the ushers will invite you forward down the center aisle, and you will be offered bread and wine. If you would prefer to have white grape juice or a gluten-free wafer, just extend your index finger, and that will be provided for you. Again, Jesus is both host and gift of this meal, and all are welcome to the table. You may be seated.
now invite you to stand as you are able. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. Let us pray together. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, and renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. Share your bread. <laughs>